So uh, good morning or good afternoon. Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jen Bonet, Executive Director of the Creative Coast. Welcome, we're really excited to have you here for one of our uh, lunchtime topics. And as a lot of you already know, we're doing every Tuesday and Thursday. move forward on learning. And um, today I have Chris Groot with me. Uh, he is um, co-founder of my site, uh, a marketing automation content creation company that builds for authors and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, as well as helps them automate. And, and Chris is the author of a number of books and has helped a number of other authors get published. And this topic um, was actually requested by, oh, I see Tom's joined us. Tom is, Tom is one of the people that requested uh, information on self-publishing. So this, this topic was requested by some of our members. And so I'm very happy to put it together and turn it over to the experts, um, Chris. Oh, thank you very much, Jen. That's very kind of you. I didn't know I'd been that good. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to you guys, and I appreciate you. I, I realize you don't have many better options than listening to me today, but I do appreciate you tuning in, and uh, I certainly appreciate this chance to share a little bit about what I've learned over the last decade or so of writing. I am Chris Brody. Uh, I did, um, my wife and I do own a company called MySite.com. Um, she started it originally as a website design company years and years ago, and then about five or six years ago, we started rethinking that um, using software in different ways and shapes and forms and fashions. Um, I'd always been in the content writing area, if you will. And quite honestly, it became something that uh, was a challenge I really enjoyed and getting down to the nitty gritty of how to get messaging across, whether that be an email or on websites, or obviously as we go into the deeper parts of the printed page, uh, an ebook or a fully published book or a compendium of books or an uh, author's compendium, if you will. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions on it. Um, some of them are right. Some of them are maybe not as right. And a lot of people waste a lot of energy and a lot of money by going in the wrong direction and then having the course correct so much that by the time they bring something to market, they've spent a lot of their time as a CEO or as a founder or as somebody in, who's an expert in their space, they, they don't get the return on their investment. So hopefully uh, by the time we leave today, you will leave with some knowledge about how to do that for the most bang for the buck and just as importantly, to value your time in what you're doing. So let's start with talking about that first of all. Um, if you own a company, you're a CEO, basically. No matter whether you do $10,000 a year or $10 million a year, your time is valuable as the founder, as the CEO, as the CFO, CCO, whatever C-level executive you are. If you think I just have a job, you need to stop for a second and think about the job that you do at the top line. And you need to understand what that cost is in hours. Hundreds of dollars an hour to be a CEO, no matter how big the company is. A lot of people don't take that into account. They think, oh, well, I'll just do it for free because my labor is free. Really not. We have to think about that in terms of any project you put out, but even more so with writing because writing is just that tedious. <clears throat> so there's a couple of different things that I recommend um, when it comes time to write. Whether you're writing an ebook or whether you're going to be submitting a chapter into a, a multi authored work, or you're going to be writing your own book. And Jen has a copy of an ebook that I wrote that uh, she can just share with you guys. I'm not exactly sure how she's going to share that, but she can share with you guys um, whether that's a link or I believe that's probably the best way. Um, but the first thing, so let's kind of go over that. The first thing first is what are you going to write about? Um, if you're going to write the next great novel, a little bit different than writing a business book or a book focused on getting new customers into your business. Um, a novel is, you know, is art. Your ebook or a book about business may or may not be art. It's designed to serve a purpose. It's designed to generate customers. It's designed to generate income. So you need to really get clear on that. Um, so the first things first is get the data. Is is who do I want 
to share this with? What do I need to share? And more importantly, where are they? So if you've got a newer business, you may not even be clear on who your customer is. Um, but you need to figure that out. Uh, you need to look at uh, you know, who consumes the printed work or who consumes a PDF if you send it out as an ebook on, on digitally. Um, you know, if you think that your customers are all 60, you need to know that they're all 60. You can't assume that they're all 60 because the way you would write and the way you would integrate that into a conversation, into a sales conversation, uh, same way as you would with a 22 year old. So first things first is getting the data. And that can be going back into, if you have a database or CRM, that can be going and talking to your clients that have been with you a long time, people that you've taken care of over, over the course of many years, finding out who those best customers are. And then mimicking that, figuring out what they want and looking at their journey that they, as they've gone through with you as clients and figuring out their wants and needs and asking them, posting it on social media, sending an email. Hey, I'm writing a book. I'm writing an ebook. I'm going to be creating this. What are some of the things that you want to see or that ask questions that you would want me to answer as an expert in this space? Send it to them. You may or may not get a lot of responses back but it will give you data. If you send out 100 emails, you may not get you know, 10 people responding. The 10 that you do get responses for is going to give you much more insight than talking to your family at the dinner table about what do you think I should write about? They're not gonna be, or talking to your friends or talking to you know, people in your circle that really aren't your ideal client. So that's, that's a big thing. Asking friends and family, they're going to give you great, Great feedback, which is absolutely useless feedback in many cases because they're not who you're selling to and they don't want to hurt your feelings. And that process could take a couple of days to get that sort of feedback, have that sort of interaction. Once that's done, you kind of have to sort through it, sift through all the stuff that you got. There's going to be some recurring themes that you'll find. People may say, you know, I really want to learn about purple polka dotted ducks. Okay. Got a bunch of people asking about purple polka dotted ducks that absolutely write the book about purple polka dotted ducks. But if nobody's asked about purple polka dotted ducks, don't write a book about them, or at least not a business book. Maybe you can write science fiction about them. But sifting through those responses and sorting out how that works in your business is a big thing. How can you tack that into current products that you offer, or potentially it gives you insight into a product you may need to be developing as well concurrently? Because you can use this book, that could be you know, what we would call a top of the funnel offer where people go, I want to read this book. And it just so happens that your business, you go, does that. And now, not only it's also acted as a way for them to learn and know about you, trust you, and want to move forward and do business with you. So the book is doing several different things. A data the outliers are maybe there's things in there that you just simply can't quite don't make a lot of sense right now but they're going to make sense in the future you need to develop a program for it so you're going to get some insight just about the book it may also be about the business kind of the third step in the whole writing process is sorting through it all and figuring out based on what they've given me what do i do with it what how do I organize this book? And I have a whole system that I use. Uh, Peggy is one of the folks on the call. She has another system that she uses. She'll be with us next week talking specifically about the publishing process. This is about the organization. But um, in, when you go to sort through all the data, you want a rational way to guide the reader through the process. Because learning, not necessarily how you do it, but how they could do it. And they're realizing how hard it can be for them to do it themselves because you really want to vet to them. I do this all the time. Our company does this all the time. And this is you to work with us because they go, Oh, I don't have hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars to do this. These guys will do it. And all I got to do is pick up the phone and do it. And some of that goes to the organization. That's how are we going to organize the chapters in the ebook that I'm going to have uh, Jen send out talks about my organization system and it's really as simple as it. 
and throwing them all out on the ground, assuming your cat and dog and your kids aren't around there, and organizing it, saying, hey, look, this, I keep coming back to this chapter is all about chickens, and this chapter is all about cows, and, and I've got all this information about horses. Well, there's three chapters, chickens, cows, horses, computers, calculators, cell phones, whatever that is, and however that relates, but you'll see the bigger picture versus trying to write an outline on a Word document or, or you know, a legal pad or something like that. You'll have the ability to, I've outlined I, 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 my novel that I'm working on right now, I've outlined like that, you know, hundreds of index cards, hundreds of ideas, some of which I never used, but that's the way I wrote the initial outline to follow. It's the way I do all my books, whether they be 100,000 word books or they're 10,000 word ebooks. So by using that system to sort through it and see that big snapshot, you can understand the flow from chapter to chapter. You can understand, well, I've only got four index cards in this chapter. I got 13 in this one. Maybe I need to concentrate and do a little more brainstorming about this one. Or do I need to just fold this chapter back into another chapter? Maybe the two chapters become one. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about the actual writing. Writing is hard work. Writing requires time. There's a, there's a few hacks in it, obviously. You can use dictation. There's plenty of talk-to-text software where basically you do a chapter on your way to work. You dictate a chapter on your way to You just have to go back and edit. That's pretty good. And there's tons of it around. You could use Rev, you could use Rev AI, Rev. Again, was one of the first ones years ago. There's a lot of different systems that will do that, that would allow you to write by just talking. And that could be in the car, that could be talking to yourself as you're walking or as you're sheltering in place these days. And you can do that. I struggle to do that because my mind goes off on little tangents. So it's difficult for me to do that. It's easier for me to write the material, but that's what I do. That's how I learned to do it. Other people have different skills. So I do have a template that I put out in the little ebook that you guys will be getting. Kind of goes through how to do that. If you were simply building it as a PDF to be something that you're going to send out. Um, template in Word. It's very easy to use. It's very intuitive. And you can put together a very nice looking little ebook, five, 10,000 words, which is actually a big ebook for most people, but you can put that together and have that functionally done in just a few days. Um, for a bigger work, when we're talking about true self publishing, there's it's a little bit more of a game there. And we're not really going to get into that right now because this is just about content creation and getting it all organized. Um, I like that I that I talk about because it's easy to use, it's easy to format. You can go to Minuteman Press or someplace like that. You can go right there, copies, a half a dozen copies, two dozen copies. They can print those up so they become a tangible book. Um, I have a client up in work, and it was only about twelve thousand words, which I know is fairly thick, but still small in the terms of a true book. We formatted it using this template. He went to a printer. We formatted it down to, I believe, six by nine. I can't remember the exact size, but he ended up with a piece of, uh, he ended up with a bound work. Uh, it was ring bound of almost 60 pages. Even though it was still just an ebook and it was done in a very simple template, it was something that he could give away because he was a speaker. He could give that away at these smaller events as a door prize or as a, as a gift. And people that he didn't have to go through the bigger publishing process, 40 or 50,000 word book. It was a really nice thing that acted as a very effective tool for his business. He could give away the digital copy to anybody who came or anybody he wanted to as a, as a leave behind for people when he had sales calls and things, send that to them. Here's how we, here, here's part of what we talk about. And now he's in a printed version which gives him some credibility at a fairly, fairly, fairly easy, easy to swallow cost. But 
it would allow him to have something tangible. Now, when we get into publishing courses, that's next week, um, there are some challenges. You have to publish and you have to format it so it works on a lot of different things. Reading it on an older iPhone, somebody reading it on an iPad, somebody reading on a Kindle e-reader, somebody reading it on a PC, somebody's reading it on a laptop. A laptop could be a big one or it could be a smaller one. You got kids on tablets. It's, it's magic. You, to be able to format a book for Kindle, you have to be a witch, I'm pretty sure. But it can be done. It's very easy to do for the right pro. There's a lot of people that run self-publishing stuff that will teach you how to do it. And it can be done. Going back to our initial conversation as CEOs, as founders, as business owners, is that the best use of your time and money? I don't know. I, I strongly recommend, you know, I can do my own taxes, but I've got a CPA. So um, that's the start of the whole process, if you will. Um, and it's a very high level, you know, strategic viewpoint. It's 30,000 feet. I'm flying through a lot of this stuff. And as I said, we do have the ebook for you. But then what do you do with the, what are the other options? So as I talked about, you can go and scale that up and write a bigger, bigger book. Uh, you can stick with the ebook like we just skipped through. And you could go with a, where you're writing a chapter in somebody else's book. I like those. I've done a lot of those over the years. We're actually launching one here soon, and I'll tell you about that later. But a um, really great way to get published. And from being published, you, you, you are an author. You didn't have to go through any of all any of the drama. You didn't have nearly the out-of-pocket expenses. You're basically you've written a chapter that is following the theme of a book. Uh, we've done several with uh, with several people around the country over the years, and, and I've written a lot of those chapters over the years. Um, but it's a really handy tool because somebody else is going to handle the publishing. Somebody else is going to handle the marketing, and it allows you to go back and say, "I'm an author," and Really, instead of going through the entire ebook process or the entire book writing process, you've written a chapter. A lot of times when we do that, there's also some training involved and somebody's holding your hand as you go through that. So that's a really useful tool. That was actually the first way that Jamie was published. Um, but uh, when you go and sit down to do the big book, 40, 50,000 words, 60,000 words, you're basically scaling up the exact same system that I've just described where you're going out there with your index cards and you're outlining. And instead of outlining five chapters, you may be outlining 15, 20, 25 chapters. Your data collection is really the same exact process. The organization may need to take some steps back and you may need to think about where are people coming back from? So for example, in my, in my most recent book, Five, six, seven that I published, that we published, um, or that somebody else published, but we wrote. Um, I had to, I was writing about building a seven figure business. And to my way of thinking, the first way to build a seven figure business is to start in the six inches between your ears and make sure that's straight. So the business rules of the mind had to be straight before you could ever do any business tactics outside of that. How the business was structured before they ever started getting into physical tactics, that became the second critical part of that. And then beyond that was the actual tactics that a business would use to build seven figures. So my organizational thought process was start inside, work outside. And I would suggest the same thing works when most of you think analytically about what a bigger book would look like. Is what's the process need to be? Do I need to start inside and work outside? Do I need to start outside and work inside? Do I need to start at the top and work down to the bottom? Bottom up. Whatever that is, you'll see that. And that's going to be the thing that guides you in your outline. And you absolutely have to outline everything first. My outlines for a full book average about 4,000 words. For an ebook, they average about 1,000 words. Full book is, to me, 50,000 or more words. Ebook is 10,000 words. So, you know, it's not quite the scale, but it's pretty close. Because I want to have really, I want to get very granular in my details of what's going to be in each chapter so that I don't go off the reservation and lose the thought process for 
my reader. I want them to be able to go A, B, C, and I don't want to throw a two in there. I want them to go, oh, now D, D comes up next. So staying organized, the outline is a huge part of that. Um, so one of the questions I always have, and there's no way around it. We talked about Rev, we talked about talk to text, but ultimately you're writing a book. There's writing involved. Um, the outline will get you so far, but if you're not going to use software, you're not going to use talk to text, you're not going to dictate it, you're, nobody's going to ghostwrite it, um, you've got to sit down and write. How do you do that? How do you sit down and write a thousand, two thousand words when a lot of people struggle to write a two or three hundred word email? And that's simple. You got to figure out when the best time to write is. Maybe that's in the morning. Now, granted, we're in a crazy time right now where everybody in the family is at home all the time. And you're seeing people that you live with and you thought you knew and you're realizing that I didn't know them that well. I, he's changed a lot since he you know, grew up. So schedules are a little bit screwy. You know, 10 year olds, 10 year olds are in, in the house instead of in the school. And so, you know, where you may have been able to steal an extra hour or two in the morning between kids go to school, you go to work. Now, suddenly kids aren't going to school. Like, ugh, you're here again. But you have to find that time. And I would, I would recommend for me, if I'm writing creatively, if I'm writing and working on the novel, it's easier for me to work in the late afternoons. I'm more creative at that point. For me to write business, it's much smarter for me to write between 10 and 2 in the afternoon. Uh, for whatever reason, that's when I'm most effective. And out and you need to have the discipline to say, okay, I'm going to do this. It's no different than going to the gym. It's no different than going to eat dinner, eat breakfast, get a cup of coffee. So having that discipline and setting that up and being realistic with yourself. I have sat down and written five, six, seven thousand words in a creative hangover. So it's easier for me to write two or three thousand in one day and then come back and I'm I can I'm prepared to do it day after day. You have to do the same thing. There's no sense in setting out to write a 10,000 word ebook and then getting a couple thousand poop and then you don't come back to it for two weeks. That's not an effective use of your time. So a little bit every day, having the discipline is a much better way than having this orgy of creativity and then, you know, stuck for three weeks with it just sitting idle. So setting yourself up. And that's where the outline comes in because you have something to come back to every single time you sit down you know exactly where you're at in that chapter or in that work. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Outstanding. Yes, it does. Good. Um, and I hate to say it, but we're about uh, halfway through here, I guess. And I don't really have much more to offer in terms of what I was going to share. Now, I've got some other things I can talk about, but if, does anybody, would anybody like to ask some specific questions? Just a question um, uh, where you were talking about ebooks, 10,000 words. In the world of writing and reading, are ebooks generally around 10,000 words or less? Oh, uh, oh, they are generally much, much smaller. In my experience, they're 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 words. And here's why I like an eight or 10,000 word ebook. You'll see the one you're going to get from Jen is exactly what I talk about in the actual ebook. I, I, I follow the principle in the ebook to write the ebook. But I like it because. Uh, you're going to give your client or your potential client or your potential customer, your ideal customer, you're going to give them a tremendous amount of value, basically for the price of an email, because they're going to probably download it digitally. So you've, you've given them this and they gave you an email. As a marketer, an email has about a $10 value annually. So, and that's exponential. So if I, have a hundred thousand names in my email list in my database that's about a million dollars if i build out my product properly if my, my product funnel my business etc and, and everybody every business is a little different but that's a good rule of thumb in the marketing world ten dollars a year for every email 
But what I really want to do in that ebook is I want to so flatter them and so overwhelm them with detail that they go, wow, if they're giving me, if, if he or she, if this company is giving me this much for free, imagine what the paid stuff is like. And with some businesses, of course, you run into compliance issues and well, I can't give you but so much financial advice and I can't give you but so much legal advice, but that's fine. So, you know, we have a, a case right now with a potential client that's really struggling with compliance. And, and I pointed out to him, you don't have to tell them what products you're selling. You don't have to tell them about the IRAs and the 401ks and everything. You need to educate them on, for example, what the tax rules are. You know, how to set up, a, how to set up, how to use an IRA or a golden IRA, or I'm sorry, a golden ROM. You know, how to set some of these things up that nobody knows about. That's information. That has nothing to do with a fiduciary responsibility. So you're giving them so much value that you're just overwhelmed and a download from some other company that may be in the same space. I hope that answers your question. The ebook that you were talking about, say two thousand, three thousand words, you're saying that's a an email, uh, an ebook that is not for sale. You are giving that ebook, giving it away, okay. and you can, yeah, and you can sell them. Mm -hmm. um, as a marketer, I look at it from the point of view of I want to give it away because I want people to know about it. I want people to understand what my business is. I want to drive them back to my website because the ebook has links in it to the website, it has e links to my scheduling. Um, and I want them to go, wow, they know so much. I need to find out more. So it's about driving traffic for me. Uh, yes, you absolutely can sell them, you know, seven, 10, 15, $20, depending on what it is. Um, because it's a PDF or because in the template that I'm sharing with you, it's done as a PDF. <clears throat> I don't know if I would go more than $10. Um, but it can be done. Now, as you go into a real book, quote unquote, as you go into that, obviously you're not going to give that away. That could be a door prize, but you're not going to give away, you know, a 50,000 word book. I mean, unless it was a gift, you're not just going to give that away to the masses. Even if you just gave them a digital copy, if you were going to do that, that would be a different marketing technique just to get the name out there. You know, you would not give away a full novel or a full manuscript for, for free. You may do 99 cents or a special where it's a dollar 99 you buy now <clears throat> but um in the ebook in ter in the terms that on which i use it it's really designed as an as a as a lead magnet for people to go wow these folks really know what they're talking about they've really got this handled it's going to do one thing perfectly and it's going to help them to do one thing perfectly so because it's something that's easy to deploy you may have five six seven ten ebooks available on your site or available in your business where they go, wow, I need to know about this. Oh, I really, you know, going back to horses, dogs, cats, kids, whatever it is, there could be a number of subjects. Look at, uh, you know, chicken soup for the soul is not eBooks, but he's got a whole bunch of chicken soup recipes out there now. Anybody else with exciting questions? Yes, I have a question. Of course. Um, it sounds like mostly what you're talking about is doing marketing um, for your business. Mm -hmm. What if the uh, like the point of the book is more uh, a novel? Do you recommend trying to do it as a publishing yourself or trying to find somebody? You have to get an agent. You know. No, you you don't need an agent, and that's a good question, Kat. And that's that's. Next week, we're going to spend a, take a much deeper dive into self-publishing. Um, I do like the self-publishing availability that's out there. Um, I think the biggest thing for what we're talking about right now is about content creation. And okay. there is, when we go into, for example, with the with the ebook Jen will be sending out, there is a, a a a strategy that I talk about in there about how to get that sorted and how to get that organized. And when we get into the self-publishing piece, in fact, Peggy, would you like to, would you like to pop in and give a quick answer on that? Sure, I can do that. Um, hi, Kat. Hey. Um, 
for more of a novel type thing, um, from what I have read other uh, people who are getting into the writing and they want to publish their novels, they are finding that uh, getting a literary, literary agent these days is a little bit more difficult than what it used to be. And it was hard back in the day, but today is really a little bit more difficult because they want to be able to know that you have a big following and it's worth to pick you up um, as an author and to promote you, you know, so they're looking for different types of things. So if you have a big social media following, um, that's a plus, or if you have um, other like writing awards, that's something that they're looking for. Um, so a lot of people are turning to self-publishing their books first and then creating that audience, creating that buzz, getting lots of people talking, and then they will look for a literary agent to help them, you know, to the next step. Okay. If that helps. Okay. Good advice. Thank you, Peggy. I knew you'd be able to knock that one out of the park. So yeah, <laughs> Kat, it's, it's, it, it, you, it's kind of a chicken and egg conversation. Um, you know, and if you are an influencer, there is, you know, that does remove a lot of walls if you've got, you know, 100,000 people on your Instagram and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is something that they do look at now. But um, for me, especially when it comes to fiction, um, that's, a, that's really, that, that's a labor of love to do fiction. And um, so it, it, and it is a changing marketplace as well. So, it, you know, it's, it's kind of different kind of the same, but as far as content creation and organization, um, some of the same rules apply, but certainly on the marketing end and, or the publishing side, they are, they are changing. They are absolutely changing. Or certainly, they have changed radically in the last decade. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else? Somebody's got to have a, somebody's got to have something exciting. Lisa, are you listening attentively? Yes, I am. I was Good. eating. I was eating my lunch, so I didn't want to be chomping. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said I'm done now. I can actually come back on. There you go. <laughs> oh. Hello. No, I was on. Uh, I was eating, and I didn't want to be disturbing everybody else. So. This That's is my okay. my lunch break because I have another Zoom call right after this one. Yeah, everybody's um, got Zoom calls these days. So nice to meet you. I think my bigger challenge is consistency. I think you made a really good point of, you know, and I do this, I'll get really good at a few, you know, and consistent. And then I go off because I get busy and then weeks will go by and then I come back to it and I feel like I'm starting all over again and I lose that consistency. So any tips on consistency? I mean, that's, I got them. I, one of the best ones ever. And, and I'm a huge, I don't know how many of you guys know Grant Cardone. Um, he is, he, I'm a huge Grant Cardone fanboy, and, and we work with some people that actually work with Grant. We work with Ted McGrath, a couple other people like that. I've, I've written with Michael Gerber of the E-Myth for many years. Uh, one of the things that I took from Grant in the, his book, The 10X Rule, which I've tried to apply to my own life is, and if you, for those of you who haven't ever read it, it's basically don't just concentrate on growing your business, concentrate on growing everything. And his idea is multiply everything by 10. So time with your family, 10 exit. Time with your time with your business, 10 exit. You know, time expanding your own brain, 10 exit. Everything, multiply, multiply, multiply. Well, we all know there's only so many minutes in a day. But we can think creatively about that. And so one of the things he did was to him when he had his when his first when his daughters were born, one of the things he did was realized that he still has an empire, a business company, a series of companies to run. He still has his responsibilities as a husband to be able to be there for his wife, be able to interface with his wife. And, and, and Elena's a lovely lady. We heard her speak uh, last year, but, um, and to be there as a father. Now, most men, I'll paint with a broad brush, most men, they're business people. My dad was the same way are busy, 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 busy. And the family and the, and, the, and the fun stuff is usually the first to go when they start to get under business-related stress. 
what Grant claimed was he rewrote his schedule to reflect being able to be a dad. Now, was it perfect? No, but he's running $500 million worth of businesses. So uh, he got up an hour earlier every day and he got his daughters up an hour earlier every day. So they had daddy and me time and they still do that. And then that gave his wife a chance to get an extra hour of sleep. And then he could go after spending time, you know, physically spending time with the children, not with the cell phone and everything else, physically doing that, he could go off, go to work, put in a full day, and then he would come back. The daughters and, the, and his wife would be doing their thing. Daughters and the nanny would be doing their thing. And he would come back. Well, they'd gotten up an hour earlier, so they wanted to go to sleep an hour later, an hour early. I'm sorry. They got up an hour earlier, so they would go to bed an hour earlier. So that allowed him to have an extra hour with his wife, just you know, spending time with his wife, doing the, you know, just sitting down watching movies, sitting down watching TV, whatever that was. And so everybody got some of him and then he was still allowed to concentrate on his business. So by having that discipline, he was able to not turn his back on some of his responsibilities. I always took some inspiration. Yes, it did take an extra hour in his day, but he gained multiple hours by simply being creative. And that's probably the best answer I can give is to think about, and, and, and as I touched on, you know, we're kind of in kind of in a weird space right now where, you know, everything's a little bit different and we're seeing people in our house that usually weren't in our house for eight or 10 hours each day. But, you know, by being creative and thinking, how can I do this if I get up an hour earlier or if I do this or what have I given up to do this? Just being creative a lot of times you'll find that answer, which will give you the discipline. Okay, every day from eight to nine, I'm going to do this. Or, you know, maybe it's once a week because you're working on a bigger, bigger, bigger project. Maybe you're going to say, look, Saturday mornings from nine to 12, I'm going to do this. Jamie and I dedicate most of our Friday mornings from eight to 12 to work on our own business, our product development in our own business. We don't do other meetings with people at that time, et cetera. It's all about building our business or our businesses. And that's blocked off, and we have to have that discipline, which allows us to focus on that. So um, that's a long answer to a very complicated question. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. Well, I think I get caught up and I have to do it every day. And I, when you said no, you could make it once a week, or maybe I could make it Tuesday, Thursday, or something of that nature. Where no, and there's no, no, nobody gave me a gold star to make me the sheriff of what you can and can't do in creativity. Whatever it is you can or can't do in creativity, whether that's Saturday morning, whether it's Friday morning, whatever that is, there's no right or wrong answer. But having the the discipline to go through it, because writing a book whether you dictate it or whether you're physically typing it is, is still time consuming. You may be able to, maybe you can, uh, I know one of our, one of our old partners uh, dictated the New York times bestseller every morning and every morning she would dictate a new chapter while she was putting on her makeup. And then she sent that to her ghostwriter and the ghostwriter would turn that gibberish into a co on, you know, the outline that they had already determined. And that's the way Laurel did it. And, you know, that was a New York Times bestseller. That was her whole system was that I got up, I got in there, I recorded it, and she just recorded it on her phone. And then she would send that recording to the ghostwriter she was working with, and they would turn that chapter over the course of a day or two, they would turn that chapter into a cohesive piece that went into the rest of the book. So, you know, whatever that discipline is, that's, you know what your weaknesses are better than anybody else. So work around those and say, okay, I'm going to steal a little time. I'm not going to watch Survivor season 40 this year. <laughs> How'd that come out anyway? I don't know. I'm aware that it's a, I'm aware that it's out there because of some post I saw on Facebook. But I, as far as the rest of it, I don't know. I think we're all playing it right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, um, Chris, I have a question. Yes. Something that really intrigued me when you said it was this idea of you're, pub you're a published author if you're published in somebody else's book. Yes. Um, so how would you recommend going about trying to find 
somebody whose book you could steal a chapter from <laughs> or write a chapter for. Steal a chapter. You can't steal a chapter. <laughs> that doesn't, that's not how this works. Yeah. How <laughs> do you approach somebody about that? Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of different ways. Now, we are actually doing one. Um, uh, it's going to be, uh, our book is Formula 567, which I already talked on, but we're going to be doing one. It's, and it's basically about, um, you know, the idea of lessons from the front line. It's, it's the things that entrepreneurs or, or just regular folks are doing. You know, when they hit pivotal moments in their life or in their business that define them or cause them to wake up, um, you know, whether it was a rock bottom or whether it was a, just a cathartic moment where you went, this is what I want to do. Pandemic? This is, well, it could be a pandemic moment, yes. But in this case, a cathartic moment um, where they just, they got it. They realized this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And this is how I'm going to make this happen. Uh, Michael Gerber talks about it. You know, he had his aha moment sitting in a McDonald's parking lot in Southern California. And that's when he realized what the e-myth really was, when he realized that the systems run the business and the people run the, the systems run the people and the people run the business. And, and, and that's, but it happened while he was eating a cheeseburger in a McDonald's parking lot in about 1975. Um, and that drove, you know, the $100 million e-myth business model for the last 40 years. So you could have one of those and that, that could be what we're doing. We're going to be launching that. Um, I don't even know if we've got the site ready to, to do that, but that's something that, that's one thing to be done. A lot of people are doing these sorts of books and are out there in your network as well. So there are a lot of different ways to find that, but it is a word of mouth thing in many cases. Um, sometimes you'll see, and I know Peggy, you've done multiple ones of those um, with your, um, I just went brain dead. I can't think of the name of it. Courage Under Siege, right? Yes. Um, so, you know, and, and, and there, so there's a lot of different, whether they be publishers, whether they be, I know Sharon Lecter did a series of them for uh, several years in a row. Uh, I know, you know, several different groups, business groups that I'm involved in or that, I, that Jamie's involved in. They've done them over the years. So there's a lot of different ways. You just have to kind of put out your feelers and your tentacles and find out what that is. And I will give you guys more information about it. I just, I, I you'll hold on. Let me see. One. Um, I may not have a site to suggest you go to to check out. Let me just look at one thing. I I know my experience um, the, from people I know, I don't belong to the National Speakers Association, but I mm -hmm. know people who belong to NSA. And within that particular association, they do a lot of those books because they find speakers uh, or exactly for that. You know, the, the, if you're an author, you get more speaking engagements and you need those books. So that's a natural tie in, I think. So uh, to your point, Chris, is you have to find the niche that you're in. And that association that you're in to see because they're doing it they're absolutely doing it um you can also do a search on linkedin uh i mean i'm getting ready to launch a linkedin uh challenge and a course because i think lots of people have lots of time on their hands and linkedin yeah. is a great resource so yeah and, and some of it too goes back and it really has to play with what's the goal um you know it's not just about being an author it's also about who's reading this book is there uh, you know, what's that person's reputation? What's, what's the, the theme, if you will, within the book? Uh, you know, there's, there's great places to go and partner with your co-authors. But you also want to look at, you know, is this going to be congruent with the message that I'm sending? You know, you wouldn't want to go if you had a, if you were a, a light worker, um, you may not want to go over here and, and go into a, a, a you know a, a, a compendium of authors that are writing about hunting and fishing. It may not be really where you're. It, it may be a, a waste of time. Um, you know if you're doing other things. So looking at that and then looking at how does that push you forward? Because ultimately this book, even if you're only submitting a chapter in it, it's going to be a calling card that you will use. So making sure that you are partnering with people. Uh, you know, there was a, 
there was one that uh, somebody offered us, we turned it down, but I saw the finished product uh, a year, 18 months later, and it was terrible. And I was very glad that we weren't involved in that because the product was very slipshod, very, it just isn't, it just did not come across as being, having been well done. It wasn't proofed, it wasn't edited properly, it didn't format very well. So, you know, going and having, you know, it's no more than the simple, it's the simple due diligence you would do with any sort of a business relationship. So keeping that in mind too, because to your point, there's a lot of people that do them. A lot of them do it very well, but you also want to make sure you get the most bang for your buck and you want to make sure that you're putting it out there into a space that's going to be complimentary for you. And so I cannot pull up the link to share with you the one that we're working on. So I apologize on that. I thought the team had squared that away, but I will um, keep Jen notified on that. And I know we'll have that available for uh, discussion. Uh, it, it, I, know, I know it'll be ready next week, but uh, I wish it would have been ready now, but I'll keep Jen posted so she can share that with you. How's that work? Um, Sounds good. All right. Any more questions, guys? This is, this, I, I, I this can be the single most useful thing that you can do. And it's, it's, it's a truly powerful thing, whether you do the work or you have somebody ghostwrite the work, um, whether you do some of the work and have somebody to copy edit the work, it's, it's, it's truly a useful tool because you're serving your clients or if you're writing fiction, you're serving, you know, people want to, people want a good story. So I, I, I love, obviously I get paid a lot to write. I, I love to write. I enjoy writing. I write a lot, but, um, you know, it truly is great, a great industry. And it doesn't have to be a mysterious or a, a, a challenging industry. It just takes a little discipline. It takes a little organization and you can write a lot of different things and use that knowledge. Again, is it your best, best thing to do? That's a question you have to answer for yourself. So I would challenge you not to get too caught up in it. Um, but if you enjoy it and it's serving your business, then it's certainly something you need to do. Awesome. Do we have any other questions before we wrap this up? I have one quick question. Uh, curiosity more than anything, because you mentioned ghostwriting. I was intrigued by the whole, you know, just you know, recording and then passing it off to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I also get the idea you know, that your time's valuable, but what does, what would it cost in a range? Because trust me, I know it, that it did that, but that's that range if you want to hire a ghostwriter to help you. But you so you're actually producing the, the first draft and then they're cleaning it up and making it work for you. Yeah. That would be editing there. That would be copy editing. If you're doing a ghost, if, now there's a couple different versions of ghostwriting. The stuff I do for my clients is we have a conversation <laughs> about what they, gracious, we have a conversation about what the product is going to look like, whether that's business or whether that's right. fiction or whatever. We have a conversation about that. I develop an outline. I send it to them. They approve the outline. And once they leave me alone. And I send them, you know, updates. It could be, I don't like to do chapter by chapter because then they get caught up and it becomes very tedious because I'm writing one chapter and editing another and it's tough to keep things straight. Usually I do, I, I do things in tranches, but um, in most of my ghostwriting that I do for people, it's the whole enchilada. Um, and then I hand that off to a publisher. Um, I have several that I work with, but, uh, you know, Disclosure, Peggy is one of them, but uh, it's basically the whole kit and caboodle. And when I'm done, I've handed them a word file that, that follows that outline and <clears throat> then they can go and work with a publisher. They can publish, they can self publish, whatever they want to do, but they have a word document that has all that done and they're ready to go step is or whatever their next stop is on their publishing train. I don't personally handle the publishing. Other ghostwriters, yes, you're absolutely right. They can, you can create the content, send that to them, you know, whether that be in an outline or whether that be an audio file of, hey, I think chapter 17 should be about blah, 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 and a five minute conversation. And then they turn that into English. Um, so everybody does things a little bit differently. I like to, um, you know, do phase by phase, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. 
and that price range is is all over the place. Um, you know, you can go to Fiverr and have people. I hesitate to use the word write, but technically they are writing stuff. I'm not going to go Fiverr. <laughs> But, but you can go there and find, you know, I, I wrote over a million words on Fiverr in one year. So, um, you know, there are, there are talented people on Fiverr, but there's also a lot of people that aren't that talented. Yeah. Um, and I used it exactly as what it was, was it was designed to help me get better, faster, and a much quicker than I could possibly do in a small business. So, you know, there are a lot of people that do that stuff. Uh, but you could go fiber, you could go, you know, find the, find professionals that do that. Um, you know, that is something that I do, full disclosure. And and the range can be, you know, from a few hundred bucks for somebody who's maybe not necessarily a native speaker to, uh, you know, some of the top ones are you're splitting royalties plus seventy-five dollars to $85,000 for the book. So, you know, the relationship is very much custom. Between the writer and the ghostwriter, between the author and the ghostwriter. Okay, thanks. I, I have a question. Say, say you uh, have an idea and you want to write an article for a particular magazine, or mm -hmm. you, you know of a number of magazines <coughs> it would fit in. Mm -hmm. How do you figure out um, uh, what they should pay you for that article? Uh, they're probably going to tell you what they're going to pay you, no matter what. Um, so I have a number of different magazines that I've published with over the years, uh, and that has been, they will tell you in many cases, they'll say it can be no longer than this many words, and it needs to be a minimum of this many words, and this is what we pay. So, for example, uh, most of the stuff that I publish is, is, is fiction nowadays in magazines, but Gray Sport and Journal pays $750 for an article, and it cannot be more than 4,000 words. Um, one of the little local ones that I work with pays 50 bucks and it can be no longer than a thousand words. Um, but because I'm one of their featured guys, they'll actually let me stretch it to 1200. So it's a wide range. Um, a lot of people with, uh, if you're a relative newcomer, this kind of speaks back to Peggy with what she was saying about publishing. If you're a relative newcomer, um, unless you're an influencer, the big guys like Forbes, Inc., et cetera, are not going to pay you until you get to a certain level. Uh, so when I was ghostwriting, and I can tell you this because the contract is now over with and I've moved on to something else, but when I was ghostwriting for uh, Inc. Magazine, I was getting paid, I think it was $400 an article, but that was by, my, um, by the gentleman I was writing for. So I, I have no idea what he was being paid. But he had, um, he certainly had the degree to be able to be in Inc., in Forbes, in a number of other business journals. But that was what I was being paid for that. That was a 500 word article. So it was more of almost a blog post, really. I see. Okay. Now, you may be able to do you know, the expose, the centerfold, if you will, where they'll give you sort of a carte blanche and be able to say, hey, anywhere, anything under 4,000 words, knock yourself out, and this is what we pay. Uh, and 4,000 words is a big magazine article. I mean, it used to be 5,000. It's a, That's a big article. Um, there's a lot of detail, a lot of research, and it is, it, it is the, the way you write a magazine article is completely different than the way you write a book or an ebook or anything like that. But, but it's, it's certainly well documented, um, but most articles now in magazines are much, much shorter. They're 500 to 1,000 words because <laughs> we're dumber than we used to be. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Anything else? Any more sticks? Any more, any more sticks? Any more hornet's nest I need to poke? Well, we've only got four minutes left, so I think we can okay. go ahead and wrap it. All right. Guys, thank you so much for joining, and certainly uh, Jen will send that out. And I apologize; I'm completely unprepared to share some more about the uh, about the uh, the chapter stuff we're doing. But I will have that up, and uh, hopefully Jen can share that, or we can put that in the description on the video. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff. So I appreciate you guys wasting another perfectly good hour for lunch. But uh, everybody, stay safe. 
And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email is actually in the ebook, so you'll actually have to read that. But it is linked to a scheduler, so if you have questions, I'm going to have a more detailed conversation available for you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank and you. thanks for joining thank us, Peggy. Yeah, we'll thank you. I look forward. Week. Yeah, see you next yeah, week. Right. Well, right, next week. It's on my calendar. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye now.